All right, so um, strongly. So just one uh, disclaimer, all the slides I'll show you, uh, first two or three classes will, well, first two classes will look at some of the slides and then we'll get into the technical stuff. So all, all the slides that we will look at have been copy pasted, sometimes directly from many different sources. Okay. Um, so first thing I want you to remember, you've probably seen many nice, beautiful simulations of, uh, you know, a boat with waves around it and very nice um, uh, Kelvin wake patterns. Uh, keep one thing in mind always, when, whenever you look at these simulations, it's not easy to do them. And it, with the com computational resources we have today, it's impossible to do a fully accurate simulation around a ship, okay? So whenever you look at results, simulations or experiments, always think about, does this make sense or not, okay? So some ways that ship hydrodynamics can, is useful, um, it, you know, it, Here's one example where you have a hull design and you're trying to, okay. You're trying to maneuver it left and right. And you can of course set up an experiment, but then you have to build out the full hull. The main advantage of simulations is it lets you do this with very, very low cost, okay? But again, um, the results here are not 100% accurate, they will never be. But they help us in deciding on uh, design choices. Okay. Here, uh, there's, that's a simulation of what the pressure looks like on a propeller. And um, that's a very good way of identifying major things that might be wrong. For instance, if you have a strange design, the pressure might be very high, which is not good. Uh, so it, it, it can help you, you know, in, in, in a very coarse way, adjust your designs very early on before you build out an experimental prototype and test it. Okay, wait, wait. All right, there is, okay, fine, fine, then, so this is a simulation of a planing hull. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what planing hull is, et cetera. So here, this is something that we will try to do in this class later on, okay? We'll, we'll try to uh, use some simulation tools to be able to set up these sort of things. And uh, the idea again is to uh, use these simulations to figure out what's the drag that your design might experience? And if that's not acceptable, what changes would you make to the design to make it perform better? All right. And here is a side-by-side -side comparison of a simulation on the left and the corresponding experiment on the right. And, and you see, you know, qualitatively at least, the behavior is very, very similar. And even quantitatively, you get a very nice match. And this doesn't happen very often. So this is a very, very nice example of a good simulation. Okay, and, and uh, when you talk about hydrodynam ship hydrodynamics, it's not just what happens in the water. You also have to think about what happens above. So if you're, superstructure looks very blocky and there's a lot of wind, that'll affect many things. It'll affect how much fuel you end up using. It'll, it'll affect the stability of your ship. So whenever you design uh, things below the water as well as above, you have to keep all of this in mind, okay? All right. Here's a simple kayak and um, okay. 
there's a very big problem with kayaks. If, if you have ever, you know, well, you probably have. Whenever you're in a kayak, what's the main thing you worry about? Flipping over. Yeah, tipping over, right? And do you know why, in terms of just looking at the design of the kayak, what's, what, why that is a problem, tipping over? They're very long and thin. Yeah? They, they have no lateral stability. Okay? So if you wanted to make it nicely um, so, uh, stable, you would basically make the midsection very, very fat. Okay? That makes it very stable. What's something else you can do? Do what? Outrigger. Outrigger, okay. Yeah, you could have outriggers which help you balance out. What about using two hulls instead of one? If you have a catamaran, that also helps stability significantly. Okay? You basically have two of these hulls sitting in the water, and uh, anytime it wants to tip over, one side provides sufficient buoyancy to get you back. Okay? Um, and, and we'll talk about all of this in a lot of detail, how, how to design these hulls to maintain stability, lateral stability, longitudinal stability, and many, many different things. Okay. And, and again, the, uh, I'll try to um, basically teach you the tools that you can use to do simulations like these. All right. Okay. And yeah, I think this is the last simulation slide. Here, uh, again, you have a uh, naval vessel, um, and, and you look at the bow wake that's generated. Okay? And the, the shape of the bow wake actually determines the wave resistance. If you can design it better to minimize wave resistance, you can save a lot of fuel. Okay? And if you can extend the range that the ship can travel to, um, or, or the time that it stays out at sea. Here we are looking at the pressure on the hull. And you'll notice whenever the pressure goes up, that's the yellow and red regions, the hull gets pushed up. And after that, the pressure drops and the hulls get sucked down again. And, and that's what you expect. Whenever the pressure is high, you, the hull gets pushed out of the water. Okay. All right. So, um, if you're interested in what, what's behind all of this, you can um, take classes at, you know, later on, if you like, in, in computational fluid dynamics. I actually taught one course. All the lectures are online. If, if you're interested, go take a look. Okay. All right. So, you know, uh, oh, you can't see me. Let me see. What do you see on your screen? You still see the oh, you still see the PowerPoint? Okay, 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 okay. Wait, wait. Uh, all right. So, um, you know, we've, we're all very familiar with boats like this, okay? There's a single hull that, and the shape looks very familiar. But that's a, how old is this design? Think about this. It's millennia old, right? The Greeks, the Romans, and even people before. Uh, uh, and they basically come, came up with this design and we still use it today. The reason is this is a very simple, hydrostatically stable design. But it, with the tools we have today, we're not restricted to just using this sort of stuff. So let me show you. Some very funky looking designs. Well, one in particular. 
Okay. That's an actual boat that some company designed. Okay. And, and there's a reason why they designed it like this. Um, in this class, you know, we'll, we'll basically learn to identify the different des design characteristics of any boat you look at and think about why it's, what pur purpose does it serve? So just looking at this guy, can you tell me some of the things that strike you immediately? You stay dry. Can you say that once more? You can stay dry. All right. So <laughs> you're saying that because it's completely enclosed, correct? Um, yes. That's and and um, that's actually becomes necessary because of the way the board operates. Um, and you see, there's a catamaran hull. They have two separate hulls and that provide a lot of lateral stability. What's the purpose of this opening underneath? Surface area to reduce? Um, yeah, so it, you re reducing surface area in the water helps in one very big way. It reduces the amount of friction that you experience. This guy actually is designed in a very strange, uh, very particular way. So the internal structure of this, not the internal structure, the, the shape of this resembles a wing, okay? So uh, if, if you cut it out, it will look like an airfoil. You know what an airfoil is? Okay, perfect. All right, so I, that, that's, I'll tell you that, that if you cut a cross section of this along the midline, it looks like an airfoil. Why would they do this? Why would they want this? How is, does it, it have? is it so that it can gain more speed, but it doesn't come out of the water? It pushes it back into the water? So that the propellers have traction still, or have, can produce thrust? So you're saying the airfoil helps it push back into the water? Uh, yes. All Although right. it looks like it's coming out of the water a bit, so it could, it could be the other one. <laughs> Okay, and uh, in the class, I have another answer, which it helps it push out of the water, okay? So the second is correct. The airfoil helps it lift out of the water. Um, think about this. Whenever we travel over water, we don't really want to interact with the water. When, whenever you interact with the water, it creates a lot of drag, a lot of friction. So that's the purpose that this design serves. It helps lift the entire boat out of the water so you're touching as little water as possible. can see as the boat speeds up, it pops out of the water and when it slows down, it sinks back in. The only point we are really interested in keeping in contact with the water is the engines, the propellers, everything else we don't want touching the water. So uh, that's what this design tries to do. Um, it, this advantages and disadvantages. So what's the, the main advantage is that you can reduce drag substantially. If you reduce drag, you need a lot less fuel to go much faster or much farther, okay? And uh, the disadvantage is you lose a little bit of stability, okay? So, um, and, and you cannot carry, carry as much cargo, okay? You're basically flying over the water. So 
you carry a lot of cargo, you're heavier and you have to generate more lift. Uh, the question is, will it be hard to turn this at high speeds? Um, no, I think we see one turn being executed somewhere. <laughs> have to be careful that you don't flip over because you are flying over the water but you you can turn much faster than a fully submerged craft would okay. so yeah this design is perfect for going fast being highly maneuverable but not very good if you want to carry a lot of cargo you won't create a cargo ship that does this um, have you ever seen military naval vessels flying above the water? Okay, hovercraft, but you know, it's relatively tame. I'll, I'll show you a picture. Professor, we can barely hear you. Oh. Okay, tell me if this mic works. Do you hear me? It's still pretty low. Okay, so this mic seems to be pretty good. So this is the mic that works? It works better. Better? Yes. Okay, so my mobile mic is useless. And this mic is fixed, so I can't get it closer. I, I wish they would test these things before I teach. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, so I was saying that um, there's even some naval vessels that were designed to basically fly out of the water because it helps them go much, much faster. I'll, I'll show you a picture. It's, it's a little scary. All right, so uh, about the design we were just looking at, that's, that's a schematic of what's happening. In a conventional vessel, you, when you're moving against anything, air or water, you build up pressure in front, right? It, just think of when you're uh, in a car and you put your hand out the window, you ex experience a lot of pressure on the front. So that's basically what this is saying. And what this does is, is it creates a force that's opposing your motion, same as the airflow pushing your hand back. This design, the one we just looked at, uses the change in air pressure in a very clever way. That's, that's the airfoil I was talking about. And um, you have high pressure on the bottom, low pressure on top, you get lifted out of the water. And that's basically what we are looking at, okay? So um, when talking about ship design, there's a lot of strange and old terminology that we have to get familiar with. Strange and old, because this is a very old uh, field. Uh, again, it goes back all the way to the Greeks, Romans, and even before, okay? 
anytime we decide on what the ship design looks like, we are constraining what our required power will be. So what our engines should be able to do, what our cruise speed will be, what our stability will look like, how much payload we can carry. So you have to keep in mind all of these different things whenever you design your ship. So a cargo container with a uh, uh, cargo ship will look a certain way. A fast rescue boat will look a different way. A catamaran, uh, basically a recreational vehicle will look different. Okay. And see, that's a full sized speedboat flying over the water. Um, you know what these are called? Yeah, they're hydrofoils, basically wings in the water that generate enough lift to lift the boat out of the water. Okay. So uh, yeah, as, as we were saying, the design is completely driven by the requirements that you need to satisfy. Okay. So let's start off with very, very basic terminology. Um, these are easy, bow is the front of the ship, stern is the back. When you start at the middle and start walking back, you're going aft. Start at the middle, start walking forward, you're going forward. Okay. Um, the most difficult that I always, that always troubled me was left and right. So for, for ships, what is left, what is right? Hey, I heard a starboard and port. Which one was which? Sure. Left is port, right is starboard. How do you remember that? Sure. Okay, left and port have four letters each. Okay. Starboard is what? Uh, no, I I don't know. Um, so. That's how, uh, you know, I, I remember now, port and left both have four letters. The other guy is starboard. Okay. So port is the left side, starboard is the right side. Oh, sorry. I'll post these slides online, so we, you don't have to write stuff. Okay, all right. And when we talk about designing the hull, we will have a few useful reference planes that we need to keep in mind. So if you, um, yeah, now I wish I had my webcam. Right, let's see if I can do this. Okay. Uh, no. Where? Ah, uh, yeah, but then I have to do this. Um, true, but I just wanted to show you this and the webcam was on it. So I, I was wondering if I could do that. All right, so you all see, you see this on your screen? Okay, perfect. So. Here's my little boat and there's, um, when you, um, so think about how people used to design boats. They used to design it on paper, right? Uh, and then they would basically have to sketch out the contours on paper and, and, and then somebody give, give it to somebody else who has to build the thing. Nowadays, what do we do? We design it in CAD, we send it to a 3D printer, print it out, look at whether it looks correct or not, redo it, we're done in a few hours, okay? It didn't used to be this easy. So um, when we take a cut right through the center line, okay? That's, that's one of the planes that we talk about, okay? Then you can take a cut this way at the center, that's another plane. You can also take a horizontal cut. Okay? That's, that's usually called a water line, okay? So that's the three, um, there's the three different, 
that's the three different planes shown here. We have the centerline plane, we have the midship plane, and we have the waterline plane. The centerline plane and the midship plane are geometry dependent. So once you build out your ship, the midship plane is just, uh, it doesn't change, right? The centerline plane doesn't change. The waterline plane uh, is not fixed. It keeps changing with how much you load the ship, what kind of water you're operating in. So the waterline plane keeps going up or down and during normal operation. All right. So uh, centerline plane, we denote with this symbol CL. Midship plane is this center uh, circle with two cuts. Waterline plane, we just call W. WP. Okay. And these are, uh, that, that's what I was talking about, different loading for the ship can give you different water lines. So if you have very little load, the, you'd probably get the bottom water line here, okay. because your ship is floating high up in the water. If you load it up significantly, then one of the upper water lines will be in play. Whenever you think of waterline, always think about your, you put your model boat or your full-size boat in water and it's horizontal or not. Uh, if it's not correctly trimmed, it would be a bit tilted. But what is the water line that wets the hull? Okay. That's basically the definition of water line. You see here, we have all horizontal lines and the contour of the ship doesn't need to be all horizontal. The bottom most line is called the keel line. Keel is the bottom of the ship. Um, this, the image we're looking at uh, here is, um, have you seen this before, this sort of image? You have? Where? Okay, I haven't, where have you seen it? Textbooks. Do you, do you know how to interpret this? Like what it's saying to you? It's basically the um, fore view and the aft view, okay? So um, if you stand at the rear of the ship and look along the ship, that's um, this part. And since the uh, most ships are symmetric about the center line, we only need one half. Okay, that's the left side shows what happens when you stand here and look forward. The right half shows what, what happens when you stand here and look back. See, this bulbous nose is what's here at the front. And this uh, rise is what we see. That's why this is higher. Okay. And um, the water lines are just marked here. That's the blue horizontal lines. These sort of drawings are what people used to use. Uh, if, if you have a few of these, basically describe the whole shape of the ship, how it changes, how the curvature changes as you go from the deck to the keel, how things change as you go from the aft to the fore, right? Yeah, so the left half is showing aft to midship, right half is showing when you stand at the, the forward end and look along midship. Usually this is what's used, sometimes people flip it. But just looking at them, you'll, you'll be able to tell which is the aft and which is the forward. Okay, that was a side view. Now think about, you're looking at water lines from the top of the ship. Um, uh, are, are you able to visualize why these look like this? So when, Tell me, when the ship is sitting very low in the water, it's submerged a lot, which water line will be in play? Which one? So you're saying if it's submerged a lot, it would be one of the larger ones here? Okay, and if it's riding very high up in water, it would be the smaller ones. Okay, and then just think about this. Uh, the water plane or water line is just where the water cuts the hull. So if you're very high up, it cuts it down below, bottom, right here. 
That's why you get the smaller curve. So this hopefully helps you see how just looking at these curves, you can design the whole ship, not design, build out the whole ship. If somebody gives you the different water lines, the different station lines, which I'll tell you in a second. Yeah, perfect, that's station. So if you make cross-sectional cuts along the hull, that these are called stations and they are numbered. Okay? So this would be station one, two, 10 or whatever. And um, looking at these views doesn't tell us much. Okay? The side view and the top view, they look like straight lines. But if you look at the, um, the fore and aft view, now again, this is telling you what the ship contours look like. When you start at the front, you have a very narrow sort of contour here. As you start going back, your ship gets starts getting fatter. Okay? That's what this shows. And that, that's what happens from the front going to the midship. If we go from the back to the midship, this is what the views look like. So right at the very aft, we have this tiny cross section. Okay. And as we go forward, it becomes thicker. So now are you able to visualize this in 3D, how these cuts can help you basically extrude out the whole hull? Does it make sense? So that's, that's the main use of these sort of drawings. Um, just use, using two-dimensional drawings, you can convey to someone what your ship design looks like. Yeah. I had a quick question. So the left is the stern of the boat in the, um, in the uh, top picture? Uh, this is the stern, this is the bow. Okay. The, the forward end is called the bow, the uh, rear end is called the stern. Okay, that makes sense, yeah. All right, and I don't know who picked this name, but uh, that's the third uh, orientation for cutting planes, okay? So we've cut along the water lines, we've cut along the center lines, uh, no, not along, we've cut along the stations, and buttocks are the lines that you get when you cut parallel to the center line. Okay. So from the top view again, you know, we're just chopping uh, parallel to the center line. And this is the uh, front and back view. Again, we just get straight lines. Um, but if we look at the side view, we'll get contours. So look at that. Um, this is right at the very lateral edge of the ship and you cut out a very small chunk. So that's what this contour shows. And as you go move towards the center, your chunks become thicker and thicker. So again, it, this also gives you an idea of the three-dimensional structure of the ship. All right. And these are called lines drawing, okay? Profile view, buttocks, top view, water lines, um, body plan, station. If you have these three 2D drawings, you have the full 3D information of the ship. Okay. And, and I, again, this is just illustrative, but usually these are numbered and dimensioned, so you can basically create a whole hull. Okay. And, and uh, yeah, th th that's what uh, um, a more detailed line plan would look like. 12 meter water line, eight meter water line. Okay. So, um, this is what people used to use for a very long time. Okay, so any questions about geometry, how to visualize things? Um, we'll, we'll use this, um, these sort of things when we try to compute the area of the water line, let's say, and why, why do we need to do that? We need to do that because we want to compute the stability of the ship. Okay? How much force can we apply before the ship tips over? Where should we place the cargo so the ship doesn't tip over? Okay? How should cargo be arranged throughout the ship so it stays level? Okay? So all, all of these things are, uh, we'll, we'll talk about them. All right. 
that's the general idea of what ship geometries look like. Now, um, let's talk about ship classification. So uh, we've, we've already touched upon this a little bit. We, we talked about how a cargo ship looks very different from uh, fast craft. Um, and, and this, all of these different types are classified into um, different well classes. Okay. Uh, there's three main categories. We talk about hydrostatic hulls. We talk about hydrodynamic hulls. We talk about aerostatic hulls. Okay. And the word basically describes what the hull does. Hydrostatic means it's a very thick hull where all of the um, all of the force keeping you afloat is, comes from buoyancy. Hydrodynamic is when you think of a very fast boat that's basically bouncing off the water. When it's stationary, it behaves like a hydrostatic hull. But when, once you start moving, the behavior changes significantly. So that's where the dynamic part comes in. These are called planing hulls or hydrofoils. Um, if you change the speed, the behavior of the boat changes. That's why we have hydrodynamic. Aerostatic are the more unconventional designs which have advantages as well as disadvantages. This is where you start using air pressure to uh, modify the behavior of your boat. So somebody mentioned hovercraft. That's an aerostatic uh, vessel because it uses air pressure to basically hover above the water. All right. So let's look at this chart a bit more in detail. Uh, we have the hydrostatic support hulls here. This is further divided into many different subtypes. Deep displacement would be a very big cargo ship. This is very stable, but what's the disadvantage? Yeah. A lot very, of resistance. It, do you say water resistance? Yeah. Yeah, so this configuration, deep displacement configuration is very stable. You can put a lot of weight on it, but there's a huge amount of water resistance. So it generates a lot of drag. Okay, so you, ca you cannot go very fast. Um, then we have the catamarans and multi-hull. This is called a SWAT. So here you basically have a very, um, very thin water line. I'll show you uh, pictures of actual boats, but there's a lot of submerged area, okay? And a catamaran, we are, that, that's, we see very frequent. Then we have the conventional displacement hulls, okay? That's what naval vessels or a cruise ship would look like. All right, that's all the hydrostatic um, types. Then we have the hydrodynamic types. Planing hull, any small craft with big engines, planes on the water, okay? And it's, if you look at the front of the hull, there's, it's designed in a very specific way to be able to go that fast. So can go very fast, but not very stable, cannot carry a lot of cargo. Hydrofoils are the uh, funky design. You're basically flying above water, not stable, um, cannot carry a lot of cargo, but can go very, very fast. Here we have, look at the characteristic speeds we have here. So cargo ship going 15 knots, um, hydrofoil going about 60 knots, okay? And, but here you still interact with the water. The only reason you generate lift for a hydrofoil is because your wing is in the water. Aerostatic support, you can be completely out of the water, like a hovercraft, or you can be very, very, uh, you can interact very little with the water. That, that's, this is called a, a surface effect ship, SES. And these, you, you see the speed reaches up to 100 knots. Okay, so again, different purposes, different design, okay? A reason for difference in speed, just like you mentioned, is drag, okay, or water resistance. Very little area exposed to the water, meaning very low resistance, high speed, and the other way around on this extreme. Okay. 
So, uh, yeah, this is basically what we were talking about. Aerostatic support rides on a cushion of air. You have different types, SES and ACP. Um, hovercraft. When would you use a hovercraft? Okay. Have you ever been to the Everglades, like in, on one of these boat adventures? They use hovercrafts. Why? Why do they use hovercrafts? Somebody, okay. Oh, uh, um, somebody mentioned that it's a swampy area. There's a lot of weed and grass. Your props will get caught up and they'll die out. Okay. So a hovercraft makes a lot of sense because of these um, close to the surface vegetation. Think about um, very shallow regions. Okay, your hull can hit the bottom and get damaged. And then you're basically beached. With a hovercraft, you don't have this problem. So you open up a lot more of the coastline that you can explore. With a displacement ship, you could not explore as much. Okay. So many advantages, OK? Um, wait, where did my question go? OK, maybe the question comes later. So there are many advantages, but we will talk about disadvantages in a second. So this is what a hovercraft looks like. Do you know how it operates? So what happens if the hovercraft runs over you? You're going to get what? A bunch of props pulling air into the water. OK, yeah, so that's the fans, right? And they basically redirect air downward. I think I have a schematic somewhere. Ah, here. So the fans are basically redirecting air downward, generates high pressure underneath. High pressure underneath meaning that pushes the hovercraft up. That's why it's floating on a cushion of air. So what happens if the hovercraft runs over you? While the fans are operating, will it be an awesome experience or will it be your last experience? No, it'll be an awesome experience because it's um, riding on the cushion of air. Okay, but you you you'll be praying that the fans don't malfunction because if they do, then that'll be your last experience. Okay, so um. Seems very cool, right? You have, you can go a hundred knots. You are uh, basically hovering over surfaces. Why don't we make all of them to be hovercraft? All all boats should be hovercraft from now on. The stability, I think. Stability. Uh, you see, it's very wide, so it's very stable. Okay. You can land, so you have heavy equipment and you land on the sea, so you can do a, um, I forgot the name, and I was a marine. <laughs> what did you say? Some, some, some marmit? Like, you can have a lot of equipment uh, deployed to the to the beach, so if you have to attack a beach, you can take tanks, you can take a trailer, you can take a whole unit and a straight land to the beach instead of having the, like, a Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima, Iwo Jima? yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so no, you're, you're mentioning more advantages, right? You come in with tanks loaded onto the hovercraft over water, just keep going, land on the beach, and you're, you're good, right? Um, so th that's what I'm asking. That there seem to be many advantages. Why, why should we not make all future boats to be hovercraft? You can't steer it that well. Okay, it requires a lot of energy, cannot steer it that well. Okay, okay. So when you're floating on a cushion of air, you can actually um, steer it somewhat better than when you're submerged. Um, one thing is, if the fans uh, malfunction, you're dead in the water or dead on land. Um, but more importantly, this it's very easy to oil these. 
you have to maintain a bubble of air here to hover and to move. Okay, if you're if you're if you don't have this bubble, you're sitting on the ground. There's no way to move. There's no wheels, no tracks. Okay, you you cannot. Uh, you're basically dead in the water or on land. So what what would you do to disable such a craft? On land. Do what? Pop, pop, pop the skirts. Okay. Yeah, that's one thing you can do. You can slash the. This is basically flexible rubber, so you can try and slash it. Okay. But then you have to get close to the thing. Think of like a, something you can do, then go home and sleep soundly. You, you can dig a long trench in the ground, right? Uh, that will disrupt this bubble and the hovercraft will basically go plop. Okay? So it's very easy to disable these. And, and, um, and then the, the, the skirt can get damaged or you, know, you dig a trench. So that's why they're, um, you know, not, not all vehicles are hovercraft. So again, everything has advantages and disadvantages. Oh yeah, that's the question. Should we only build hovercrafts? Okay. Uh, yeah, so they are very expensive and compared to a simple boat with props, you have a significant increase in maintenance requirement. The fans, uh, you know, anything that works a lot or any moving parts are the most likely places to fail. Not very durable. That's what we were talking about. Rough terrain, flexible skirt. Okay, and simple obstacles. Yeah, disable a hovercraft. Um, but it's very useful if you want to transport things on water um, um, quickly. All right. Um, this is a New York City fireboat, so you want to get to the fire quickly and put it out. Hovercraft, very good. Uh, ferries for carrying. Um, that's not a hovercraft. That's an SES. So it basically generates a bubble in between. Okay, let me see. Do we have SES? Okay, so it's a catamaran, and there's a gap in between. Okay. All right, perfect. So that was all the weird um, aerostatic support ships. Hydrodynamic support, we talked about supported by moving water, planing hulls, or hydrofoils. Okay. Um, if you've seen these luxury boats, you know, very long, uh, they are planing hulls. The faster they go, the nose lifts up out of the water, and that lets them go even faster. Uh, this is a hydrofoil ferry. Um, oh. Um, this is a, uh, actually a partially uh, surface pier piercing hydrofoil. So the wing looks like a V here. Okay. And the submerged part generates lift. Um, and the, the advantage of using such a design is it's structurally more sound uh, because it's supported in two places. Um, okay. Ah, here. See, I told you about naval vessels that fly above water. This is one, okay? I don't know if it's still in service or not, but they definitely designed and deployed this one. Um, I think that's a radar, not sure. So advantage, very, very fast. You can go to where you need to be very, very quickly. Disadvantage, not stable, yep. So, very unstable, well, not very unstable. You can always drop your speed and then you're basically become a regular boat. But then you have to go slow. So, um, um, also, these, there's a lot of force acting here at the hydrofoil joints. So you have to make sure they don't break off. Okay. Yeah, look at this, that's the same ship. And <laughs> you don't want to be, on that one, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, and the last guy, the most normal kind of ships are hydrostatic support ships. Uh, nearly all military cargo ships and uh, 
that's why uh, I'll show you. Where are the pictures? Okay, pictures come later. Okay, so um, before we go to pictures, let me ask you a question. What happens when you drop a piece of wood in water? It does what? It floats, I think. It floats, you think? Usually it floats. Okay, there are a fire engine. <laughs> uh, usually it floats because there are some wood species that are very dense and they will sink. Okay. Now, next question. What happens if you drop a piece of steel in water? It will sink. Are there any other answers? So everybody agrees a piece of steel in water will sink? It depends on how the steel shaped. All right. Uh, yeah, so it depends on whether you drop a ball of water, a, block, a ball of steel, a block of steel, or a boat in water, OK? Um, so um, um, well, most. Naval vessels now are made of basically uh, metal, but most luxury craft are made of a fiberglass because it's light and corrosion resistant. Okay. Um, so uh, buoyancy is, uh, you know, now it might seem obvious to you, but remember Archimedes, how happy he was when he discovered what buoyancy meant, uh, running naked in the streets of where? Milan? Somewhere in Italy, yelling Utica. Um, so um, it, it's, it's really, when you really think about it, it's very, very amazing that water lets you support all of these very heavy structures. And all of that comes down to um, buoyancy. Okay. How do you define buoyancy? Very simple definition, not technical, just very intuitive definition. Ability to float, okay, okay. And now let's get a um, little more technical in talking in terms of force and weight. Buoyancy. Um, usually equal to the weight of what? Of the boat. The volume of water displaces. Okay, okay. All right, okay. So all of you guys are saying correct things. Uh, so let's go step by step. So uh, one answer was the weight of water it displaces. Okay. So that's the basic definition of buoyancy. Any, uh, whatever weight of water your object displaces is how much force it will experience in the upward direction. That's buoyancy. So if you think of a ball of steel, it displaces, let's say, one kilogram of water, or which is 10 newton of water. It will experience an upward force of 10 newton, okay? But it will sink because its weight is much larger than 10 Newton, okay? Now you beat out this, um, beat down this ball of steel into a flat plate uh, and curve it a little bit, basically shape it like a boat. This time, assuming that the water doesn't flood the insides, you will be displacing a lot of water, okay? All the dry, space taken up by the hull is what you're displacing. Okay? And if your weight is less than this force, you will float. Otherwise, you sink. That's, that's basic, the basics of buoyancy. Okay. Now, um, 
If I poke a hole in the hull, what, what happens? They would sink. It sinks because, tell me in terms of buoyancy. Because the weight uh, would increase. The, the weight would what? Increase, which would, because water is uh, entering the hole or the uh, above the water plane. Mm, partially true. So I'll, I'll give you a different way of thinking about this. When you poke a hole, weight, water starts filling, uh, pouring into the hull. Okay. The amount of displaced water now goes down because the empty air inside the hull is no longer the same as it was before. So if the thing fills up completely with water, there's no empty air inside the hull. So you're not displacing as much water. You're only displacing the, the volume of the sheet itself. Which is basically like if you were a sphere. So that's why you sink, okay? It's not because you're taking on extra water. It's because you lose the displaced volume once you start filling up with water. This uh, concept becomes very important when we talk about when our hull gets damaged. Let's say you hit a rock. One compartment will start flooding. So you lose that amount of displacement. Okay? Somebody else has to make it up. Um, so that's why ships have the ability to seal off flooded compartments because the whole thing doesn't sink in one go. Um, yeah, and we'll talk about how one part being flooded affects the stability. If you start uh, healing to one side, okay. uh, again, later. Okay, so yeah, this is a very simple, uh, well, basically the same thing. If you have a block of wood that uh, submerged this much, that's the amount of water displaced. So the weight of this much water with, with how much force you get upward. Uh, if your weight is larger than this force, you sink a little bit more and displace more water until you reach equilibrium. If your weight is lower than this force, the force pushes you up unless you displace less amount of water. Okay. So you reach equilibrium when exactly Weight force is equal to the weight of the ship. Weight of ship, we usually use a cap, uh, delta symbol. And uh, volume, displaced volume, we use a navla symbol. Okay. Again, we'll come to that. All right. This is the swath that I was talking about. Okay. It's small water plane area, twin hull. So you see. The water will, level will be somewhere here. And the cross section that's wetted is very small, but you still generate enough um, support from all of these very thick uh, submerged um, parts. Okay. Just like regular catamarans, it has very good roll stability, but because you need to be submerged significantly, you have a deep draft. So you cannot go into coastal or vegetated areas. All right. Okay, so all of these are hydrostatic support ships. Displacement, SWAT, catamaran, submarine. Submarine when you're um, surfaced. Yeah, been around for centuries and millennia. Very good for roll stability and that's what we're seeing here. Even though you have impart a lot of momentum to the side, if you don't, if you do this on a kayak, what will happen? It would tip over. And the reaction will tip you over. Okay, so um, you you need to ensure good high, uh, lateral stability to uh, withstand all of that. Do you know what this circle? is it's it's shockwave okay explain more all right anybody know how to explain why we get this circular thing in the water 
uh, I have a, I have a, I have an idea. I think as the, uh, um, uh, like the guns, you know, they 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 give you a um, force, and it pushes the boat back. Okay. And I think that's just the resultant of the wave uh, of the movement of the ship. Okay. Any other? Is that from the gases that are escaping the uh, chamber of the gun? It's expanding rapidly and causing a force in a circular direction. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, some answers correct, some not. Um, what happens when you fire a bullet from a rifle? Have you ever seen videos of uh, the air around the bullet? Yeah, I guess it suspends. Um, so that's what the air looks like uh, around a bullet. This very thin region, that's a shock wave, okay? And uh, there, it's basically an infinite, uh, um, almost infinitesimally thin region where the pressure rises uh, tens of times. Um, so this happens whenever you have something that's flying supersonically. A bullet flies faster than the speed of sound in air. So it'll generate the shock wave. Military aircraft, when they fly supersonically, same thing happens. Okay. Uh, You see the same sort of structure, this shock wave. So when you fire the shell from the cannon on the boat, the bullet, or no, not the bullet, the shell basically drags a shock wave along with it. And it as it passes by, you know, the, that's the circular, um, the, the, the circular rot rot in the water that we were looking at. Um, yeah, so you, from this image, you can tell exactly where the shell is located. It's right around here. That's the tip of the shock wave. Okay. So the, the shell would be right around here. And the, when the shock wave hits the water, that's when you get all this turning. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is again a SWAT ship where you have Catamaran style, very, very small water plane area. Ooh. Uh, are you old enough to have watched Tomorrow Never Dies? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I think they discontinued this ship. Uh, so this is um, uh, this. OK, why, why does this ship look like this? It's a ship, but why does it look like this? To be a stealth, I think that was what they're trying to do at the time. Okay, okay, stealth, yes. And how does this help with stealth? Do you know? Uh, by sonar, so the, the whatever the the radar yeah. bounces and it doesn't get back to the to the transducer. Yeah. So the way radar and sonar works, which is basically how we try to detect other ships or aircraft, is it sends out a pulse of um, sound and um, well in case of radar radio waves and when the waves uh, hit something they get reflected back and you measure the reflected signal think about what happens when it hits this on uh, planted surface so wave comes in and then gets bounced off in this direction okay. it's basically like light reflecting at uh, this flat surface so it never comes back to you, or if it does, very, very small amount, barely detectable. So this is why most stealth ships and aircraft have these sort of angular surface designs. Okay, another example of SWAT. Oh, I didn't notice the eyes. This is a SWAT. Um, uh, yeah, because you see the hull is very 
the water water plane area will be very very tiny so there's a lot of there's a big bulbous parts that submerge underneath a catamaran would have like a normal hull shape just two of them okay so let me go back to the swath ah yeah look this is the difference between a swath and a catamaran all right yeah more hydrostatic sport okay okay ah yeah when when your uh, when a sub is surfaced, it's basically following Archimedes. Um, oh, um, hmm. how do submarines work? If how is the natural tendency to float or to sink? It is the float, I think, but then they have a ballast tank that they bring in water to enable them to sink. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. So uh, think about all what's inside the submarine. It's basically a tube, right? Inside the submarine, you have it's filled with air. Otherwise, people cannot occupy the inside. So you're displacing that much water. And you're displacing sufficient water that you will float unless you you remove some of that um, displaced displacement capability. How do you do that? You do that by flooding the ballast tanks. When your weight, uh, when your displaced volume becomes equal to your weight, you start going down. Well, slightly larger, you start going down. Okay. So subs cannot um, uh, submerge without taking on water. Uh, the, would you design it the other way that they want to be normally submerged and you would not want to design it that way because yeah very very difficult to bring it back up and if there's an accident you, know, you lose power there's no way to uh, surface okay okay uh yeah we're out of time so we'll keep going next class any questions all right so see you next time